Well, welcome to another episode of the Scriptural Mormonism Podcast. I'm your host, Robert Bottom. Today, we have a returning guest, my good friend, Josh Gailey. We'll, um, he'll introduce himself just momentarily. Just in terms of announcements, um, as many know, on the third Sunday of every month, I appear on the Interpreter Radio Show with Chris Fredrickson and Bruce Webster. So that's on K-Talk. Uh, if you're going to go on the Interpreter Radio Show or the website, you can actually find some ar uh, archived episodes. Next month, I'll be on the third Sunday, as usual, discussing Hebrews 7 to 13. But I might be on the following Sunday with Don Bradley discussing the epistle to James. So that'll be fun. And speaking of Don Bradley, he will be coming on in the near future on the podcast to discuss Mariology with myself. So that would be a fun episode. And one other announcement, on Sunday, the 22nd of October, myself and Adam Stokes, who's a mutual friend of ours and um, Josh and I, we will be having part two of our dialogue on whether early Latter-day Saint scriptures, such as the, in this case, the lectures on faith and first and second Nephi, teach modalism. Previously, part one, which was a few weeks ago, we discussed various issues, such as the Book of Moses and the Joseph Smith translation and so forth. So that will be a very fun uh, discussion and dialogue. Um, both myself and Adam have a background in theology. And hopefully in the new next year, we will have one or two discussions on whether the New Testament teaches modalism or not. So be on the outlook for that. So as I said, uh, we have a returning guest, a good friend of mine, Josh Gailey, who is a member of the Church of Jesus Christ, a.k.a. the Bicker Knights, the third lyricist Mormon Restorationist group, and the second lyricist to take the Book of Mormon seriously. Uh, he appeared twice last year on or, um, the podcast, wants to plug his book, uh, if you want to um, hold up your book there. There you go. It's uh, Witnessing Miracles. Uh, historical evidence for the resurrection and Book of Mormon. I will include a link on the show note. And he came um, appeared a few weeks after that to discuss the history and theology of his particular group in the restoration. So um, he also has appeared on Ward Radio, um, where he had some very good one-liners um, throughout the show as well. So uh, be sure to check out that episode after you check out the episodes I have on my podcast, of course. That's right. Uh, so uh, Josh, pleasure uh, to have you on again. Good to be back on with a friend and one of my favorite minds um, in favorite minds, period. And one of my favorite minds in the restoration movement, for sure. So, Robert, nice. it's it's great to be with you. Yeah. And uh, although we do have a number of theological uh, differences, you know, my being a member of the LDS Church, you being a member of the Church of Jesus Christ. Um, today's topic, we will be focusing actually on a topic where I don't think there's actually going to be any substantial difference. And that's the nature of justification and also water baptism, its meaning and its purpose and related topics as well. But before we kind of delve into that real fun topic of soteriology, uh, how about you just, for those who may not be familiar with you, uh, how about you just give like a brief introduction to like uh, who you are and uh, your background and so forth? Sure. So my name's Josh Gailey. I'm an evangelist of the Church of Jesus Christ. So to reference us as who we are within the restoration movement, we follow at the death of Joseph Smith, Sidney Rigdon. Through that, uh, a leader was raised up named William Bickerton, and our history follows through mostly in the western Pennsylvania area in the mid-1800s and expands out to today where we are in about 24, 25 countries around the world, about 30,000 members. So we're an international church and built on the foundations of the Restoration. So we're a Bible and Book of Mormon thumping. Our heartbeat are the scriptures in the Bible and Book of Mormon. And everything after that flows from that. I'm an ordained evangelist in the church. And our structure is, is such as you would find in the New Testament of apostles, evangelists, elders, teachers, and, and so on. So we're a, a very simple form of a restoration church. And, and that's something we're not afraid to hang our hat on, both in, in, uh, what we believe and and what we hope for so that's good oh that's good and just like for people who may know you both ex you your group accepts both the book of mormon and the bible as authoritative scripture and your group is pretty consistent um pretty insistent if you will that you know the book of mormon is a historical text and it's a translation of a document it's not allegorical unlike a uh, group <clears throat> that won't be mentioned today 100 yeah, percent. yeah we believe it's a, a real history that's yeah. That's a foundational belief of the church, no doubt. Yeah, yeah, and that's one thing I appreciate about you. Like, uh, you've appeared recently on Fair's um, Book of Mormon conference only a few days ago, where you give a brief overview of your very good book. Everyone should get a copy, by the way, um, where you, you affirm, yes, just as the resurrection of Christ is historical fact, by the way, amen to that. The Book amen. of Mormon and the gold plates were a historical reality as well. So 
uh, that's good. It's um, our two founding miracles. Yeah. And amazingly, the pattern of the Lord's fingerprint of the historical tracing that you can do applies to both. I know that's not what we're doing tonight. Yeah, yeah. But course. it is fun. It is fun to consider that the the fingerprint of the Lord is upon these two incredible miracles that continue to shape our day. So. Yeah, and uh, it should be known that he used the minimum facts approach as Gary Habermas and Michael Cohen and others use for the resurrection of Jesus Christ, which he seems to be like the most popular um, mainstream defense, if you will, of the reality of the uh, resurrection, and you transpose that to the plates in the Book of Mormon. So, um, so hopefully that uh, will in intrigue some people to actually get a copy of the book or at the very least uh, check out our podcast episode. But as I said, today we'll be discussing soteriology. And the reason why I invited you on is because there was actually an article published by Interpreter uh, only like maybe a week or two ago. And I say this as someone who's a huge fan of Interpreter. Um, the second half of the article, I was not a fan of because the author seems to actually shy away from like what I think is the clear rather explicit teachings of restoration of scripture, but also the Bible, that baptism is the instrument by which God uses to bring about regeneration and initial forgiveness of sins, you know, the technical term being baptismal regeneration, but uh, you kind of amend my comments, if you will. Uh, I totally that, did. Yeah, totally. And it's like, okay, maybe maybe I should actually have Josh on because it's been a while since being on the episode. We've actually had fun, even even when I had times I had to bite my tongue when you were discussing some aspects of early LDS history that we disagree <laughs> about. Yeah, yeah. I can be nice at times, people, but on this issue, I think we're going to be having like a lot of agreement. So um, hopefully we can actually maybe discuss um, what baptism is, justification and you know can a truly justified person lose their salvation i think they're they're like the very heavy hitting topics because if you believe in those topics a number of other things consistently flow out of it for instance if one were a calvinist and they believe in total depravity and absolute predestination then it's pretty consistent to hold to like a limited theory of atonement because well why would christ knowingly die for people he's actively condemned to hell and so forth so Again, like uh, theology does matter, and um, we do try to be as consistent as possible, even if we we're fallen epistemologically. So, uh, Josh, uh, how about you kind of give a brief overview of like how you would understand, like, say, um, baptism, justification, and the issue of like whether someone can lose their salvation, and then we kind of like maybe discuss, like, say, some common misconceptions and some texts for and against various positions. Yeah, let me lay out what I see. Jump in, Robert. I mean, I don't have to. Just if I get carried away, jump in, steer me back. You know, you're much more the theologian. I'm I'm an amateur to, who loves the scripture, you know, and kind of has a foundation of of what I believe and what the scriptures say. So let's go. Let's let's walk down the path. So for me, it ties into the basic bare bones. And if I was stripping everything away, because I'm not somebody with, you know, a PhD from a seminary, you know, if I was stripping it away, I want my theology from the letters of Paul to match the acts of Paul in the book of Acts. And if those two come together and harmonize, to me, I think we're, we're making progress. So when somebody asks the question, if somebody hears the gospel and asks the question, what must I do to be saved? And your answer does not match the apostles in the book of Acts, I think you have a problem. And that is me maybe oversimplifying what is centuries and centuries of tradition and theology, but it, it is meant to be a simple gospel with a simple plan of salvation. And so for me, the gospel is, is six points out of 3 Nephi chapter 27. It's, it's six points. The Lord says, this is my gospel. And when he does it, he, he lays it out perfectly and and I just think that this is paramount for the start of any of this. And it's Jesus came, his condescension. Okay, that's that's the first part. It's his calling as Messiah from the Lord. He's anointed as Messiah. He's obedient to the Father, even unto death, the death on a cross. Okay, he's not left in the tomb. He's raised. Okay, so he's the resurrection of Christ. And finally standing before him in judgment okay those six points are the gospel that we find in third nephi chapter uh, 27 now we understand faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of god so when we declare that message to somebody 
they can choose to accept or reject that message. They can choose to accept or reject that gospel. If they're accepting of that gospel and open to what the Lord has done for them, as the as the gospel was preached on the day of Pentecost, and people are pricked in their heart in Acts chapter 2, and they say, what must we do to be saved? What's the command from the apostles? Repent and be baptized. So to me, the theology is the foundation of what is the gospel. Is justification in there? Absolutely. I think what's interesting to me is in Strong's, and you may know the actual Greek word. I mean, Robert, you're you're on point with a lot of this. So I trust in your knowledge of, of some of the, the actual Greek. But in the Strong's Concordance, when you look up justified, as it would be said in Galatians 2 or some of the other places, that word essentially means innocent. So the portrayal is you're made innocent. So something that's really interesting to me in all of this is first, we recognize the fall from the garden and that imagery, right? And being separated from the Lord. Adam's no longer innocent and he's separated. Well, what's interesting is through Christ, we have all mankind, believing or not, are justified in the sense that they will be brought back to stand before the Father one day, brought back to stand before Christ one day for the judgment. Point six. Okay, so through the atonement and through the resurrection, we will all resurrect and stand before Christ one day. So there's there's something that the Lord does. Then judgment comes, and there's an interesting point in Nephi. And, and if I'm getting way off and you want to jump in, if I'm getting too far, jump in, Robert. But I think there's a scripture worth reading tied to this in the Book of Mormon. And to me, it would be Second Nephi 2. 5 through 10. I know that's a lot of verses, but would you mind if we read that together? Go ahead. All right, let's let's pull it up. What I'll do is I'll actually share my screen so people will actually see the text. If that's okay. There you go. Yeah, that's great. Let me know when you have it because I'm going to pull it up uh, online here. Uh, second Nephi 2, 5 to 10, right? Yeah. Because this is one of the times when the justification as a word and as a phrase isn't used in the Book of Mormon very often. So I think here is a good one for us to dive into within the gospel to see what this is, is really saying. Because it's being tied to coming into God's presence and being separated from God's presence. So if you look at 5 through 10, I'll, I'll start going. It says, and men are instructed sufficiently that they know good from evil, and the law is given unto men, and by the law no flesh is justified, or by the law men are cut off. Yea, by the temporal law they were cut off, and also by the spiritual law they perish from that which is good and become miserable forever. So with justification, or that innocence, we're allowed to be in the presence of the Lord, but if you're not as innocent, you're cut off, and actually in the Book of Mormon, I counted 17 to 18 times. I think the number's 18 times that the phrase cut off from the presence of the Lord is used in the Book of Mormon. And so if justified and innocence in the gospel is bringing us into his presence, then if we're not innocent, we're going to be judged and cut off from his presence. And so I think that's the imagery that the Book of Mormon is showing. I think it's well supported in the New Testament as well. But it goes on and says, wherefore, redemption cometh in and through the holy Messiah, for he is full of grace and truth. Behold, he offereth himself a sacrifice for sin to answer the ends of the law. So that brings about that justification. Unto all those who have a broken heart and contrite spirit, and unto none else can the ends of the law be answered. Wherefore, how great the importance to make things known unto the inhabitants of the earth, that they may know that there is no flesh that can dwell in the presence of God. So here we were talking about being cut off from the presence. There's no flesh here that can dwell in the presence of God, save it be through the merits and mercy and grace of the Holy Messiah, yea and amen, who layeth down his life according to the flesh, taketh it again by the power of the Spirit, that he may bring to pass the resurrection of the dead, being the first that should rise. So the author here, I think it's Nephi. Um, it's either going to be Nephi or Jacob, but I'm going to presume it's Nephi. Um, understands both the gospel 
and how that brings us back into the presence of the Lord. Wherefore, he is the first fruits unto God, inasmuch as he shall make intercession for all the children of men, that they may believe in him shall be saved. And because of the intercession for all, all men come unto God. Wherefore, they stand in the presence of him to be judged of him according to the truth and holiness which is in him. Wherefore, the ends of the law which the Holy One hath given under the inflicting of punishment which is affixed, which punishment that is affixed is in opposition to that of the happiness which is affixed to answer the ends of the atonement. So to me, the scripture answers it better than I ever could, but I'll, I'll leave it to you, Robert, to make any comments you want or corrections that you see in that, in that long answer. Oh, no, no. I'm glad you kind of touched upon, like, say, Dikayao to justify and how it's not simply a legal um, category. You, you kind of mentioned, like, how it means innocent. It means to make just. And I think, like, that, this is one of the hinges between, like, say, the largely present interpretation of the various texts uh, that are disputed, like Ephesians 2, Colossians 2, and, you know, the restorationist interpretation. You know, um, I say restorationist because although we do have uh, pretty great differences in many areas. Uh, this is an area we actually would agree on, that when God justifies someone, it's not only a change in legal status, but it's also a transformation of the person. Um, you can see this like in how like Omicron Omega verbs are used in Greek, uh, which decay out OEs, and they're often used either as something that transforms someone or a declaration of something that's internal to this someone, like to be blind and so forth. Uh, and even like one text that uses dikeao in a Christological context is actually, I'll actually pop up here. It's 1 Timothy 3, 16, which is an early Christological hymn. Uh, the King James says, and without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness, God or he who was manifest in the flesh justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up in glory. Um, now, the I like that. I like that justified in the spirit because, yeah. you know, both in Corinthians and Ephesians, it says that we're sealed unto salvation by the Holy Spirit. So there's this image of if we're justified in the spirit, that's the image of we're made pure and holy before God by having literally the the holy spirit indwelling inside of us so that when we appear before god on that last day in judgment he sees himself in us and that allows us to remain in his presence so and i think sees, it's well said he sees him in us not by a mere imputation or covering but because of our transformation internally as well Ex oh exactly right yeah yeah and and the reason why i bring up this text is like paul is speaking about christ's transformation if you will at the resurrection christ was not simply declared legally to be raised from the dead god transformed him and raised him up to the dead so it kind of shows like how in this text um dikai ao not only has like a declarative sense but that legal declaration is based on a reality uh one text presence often appeals he's like deuteronomy 25 verse 1 and other texts where the judge um, makes a legal statement about whether someone is righteous or innocent. And some, like say James White, uses this as evidence of imputation. But if you look at the Jewish law court, or even the law court of Hellenistic times, there's no imputation of guilt or righteousness. The innocent person is found innocent in Deuteronomy 25, 1 and Leviticus 17, because they intrinsically are innocent. And the person is found guilty of blood guiltiness or whatever it is because they have committed blood guiltiness. It's whenever, so even, yes, there is like a legal aspect to whenever he, Greek dikaiao or Hebrew tesak is used, but it's never in a sense of a legal fiction. When it's used in the legal sense, the person is making a legal judgment based on the reality they perceive. And when God declares us legally righteous, it's based on a mental representation of a reality he's commenting on. And if you look at like, say, the King James, it sometimes translates, I would say mistranslates Hebrew kashav and Greek logizomai as to impute. But if you were to do a lexical analysis of these terms, it's a predominantly a mental representation of the reality wise commenting on. Um, so I think once one kind of realizes that justification is not only a legal event that's external to us, but it's an event where God transforms us internally 
there's a change, not just of legal status, but also of our nature from um, being basically godless to godly and so forth, you know, where we're sinful and that we're made just, um, that kind of answers a lot of the issues. Um, well, and so hence the need for baptism to cleanse our temple, right? It's the perfect transition Yeah, because, it, you know, something in scripture, there's layers to scripture. It can be two things at the same time and be perfectly correct. Yeah. That's, that that's, the, what that's I was the problem with Carlson Terminetic. You know, it's not either or, it's both and, you know. Exactly. Exactly. So one thing feeds into another and it builds as the gospel is this complete and beautiful message to be declared and then believed on or not. And if believed on, then we have a choice if we believe of what to do, which is really, I mean, that's where the Calvinist would raise up their hands and go, there is no choice, but it, you know, it really is the fundamental foundation of the gospel is people hear the message in Acts. They're preached the gospel in completeness. All six points from third Nephi 27 are preached by Peter in Acts chapter two. They're all there. Okay. Then it, the people believe or don't believe. And the ones that are pricked in their heart and believe they ask the, well, what do we need to do now? I believe you. I believe this message. What should I do next? And the call comes out, you know, for repentance and baptism. And the Lord's real clear about repentance. I mean, I think it's Luke chapter 13. You must all repent or you will all likewise perish. I mean, he's very clear on the, the need for repentance. So, so before we kind of delve into like say some of the baptism texts, because I would yeah. I, I definitely want to discuss like Acts 2 and also Romans 6 and 1 Peter 3. I think they're very right. powerful texts. Um, what are some of the common misconceptions people have about the doctrine of baptism or regeneration? Um, you know, I'm sure you've come across some, I've come across a few as well. So um, you know, you know, one I've come across is like, well, you know, baptism is a human work and you're trying to obligate God to reward you legally. And that's a denial of God's grace. You're at, you're trying to add to Christ's atonement. That's one common misconception. Um, what are some of the other misconceptions out there about the uh, doctrine that you've come across? Well, I, I think the primary is what you're hitting on the head is the accusation from a Protestant, primarily Calvinist background that it's a work. Yeah. Okay. And, and because it's a work, it's not necessary unto salvation, which then brings you in conflict with some of the actions of the New Testament church, in my opinion. But with that said, I think that's the probably the number one critique that's out there. I would say the other things that are out there are based on age and whether or not you need to repent first and have to be old enough to understand what repentance is to participate in that ordinance. And I think the Book of Mormon is the perfect document to make that crystal clear on what's acceptable and what's not as far as baptizing infants or children or, or not. And, you know, so I think another misconception is, is when that's necessary, all right, when that ordinance needs to be participated in. And when we cover those two things, probably 90% of the Christendom would fall under the banner of those two misconceptions and critiques. And, it's not that there aren't others. I mean, for us, baptism is a beautiful covenant. That co and and I think sometimes that gets lost as well. Is the the image and importance of covenant from the Old Testament is not lost on the New Testament church. Our very commitment and entering into the Lord is a covenantal relationship with Him through baptism, and I think sometimes we miss that aspect as well. And need to be reminded of that. Yeah, in fact, uh, the relationship between, say, the old and new covenants, like Paul understood this in Colossians 2, which is, funny enough, a parallel text to Ephesians 2. Um, he uses, I'll actually quote from the King James, verses 12 to 14. Buried with him in baptism, wherein also ye are risen with him through the fate of the operation or the energy of God, who hath raised him, Christ, from the dead. And you being dead in your sins and your uncircumcision of your flesh, he had quickened together with him, having forgiven all your trespasses, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way kneeling to the cross. But in the previous verse, he speaks of, you know, in whom he also you are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, in putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. So Paul would use the Old Testament circumcision, you know, which was like a physical act, you know, 
um, and show that as a type that has been fulfilled in its anti-type, that is baptism. You know, just as, uh, you know, Old Testament circumcision removed a part of oneself uh, physically, water baptism, which is the new covenant circumcision, if you will, made without hands, that is, it's from God, it's not idolatrous and merely physical. That's what Ekkar Payain means. Um, how uh, it's a new covenant circumcision, and that's the instrument by which we participate in Christ's new life and so forth. So apart from like being a very important baptismal regeneration text, it kind of shows, yes, even Paul and the New Testament authors were explicitly cognizant of this, um, of the relationship between the Old and New Testament. And it kind of shows like baptism is a multifaceted thing. It's not simply for the remission of sins, which is very important, but it's also there's an ecclesiastical element to it. It's where your one is initiated officially into the church. Um, there's also a covenantal aspect to it as well, you know, such as the covenant of baptism one finds in Mosai, I believe, chapter 18 in the Book of Mormon, and so forth. So again, one has to be very careful, like having this either or faulty hermeneutic. It's often both and. And when it comes to baptism, yes, you know, it's initiation, it's an external affirmation of one's faith and repentance, but it's not either or, it's, and it's also regenerative and it's for the remission of sins. Um, yeah, when we lay out all the scriptures, we don't have to be doing a harmonization that it, ex, that privies one over the other, to your point. We can build this together and say, okay, when Paul gives his testimony in Acts and he says Ananias comes and commands him, you know, why are you waiting, Paul? Come on, let's get up, go get baptized so that your sins can be washed away. Well, that's crystal clear. All right. That's very clear. Baptism is for the washing away of sins. Okay. Before the Lord, because you're accepting the covenant. You're, you're coming into that relationship with Christ who has performed the act that he needs to do to open up that door for us to receive that salvation through him. And so, you know, with all that said, you, you have that very clear scripture. Then you go over to, you know, to Romans chapter six, buried with Christ in baptism, arise a new creature unto Christ. So wait a second, are, are, are sins being washed away or are we being symbolically buried in the tomb with Christ? Yes. Yes, it's both. And that's okay. That's a safe place to be. Yeah. And one will know that the forgiveness of sins, it's never preceded by baptism. It's always after baptism. Um, and like you mentioned, Acts 22, like where Ananias, um, you know, baptizes Paul and it's for the washing away of sins. Uh, funny enough, Paul calls on the name of the Lord in that text, which kind of answers like one of the popular objections, like Romans 10, 19, you know, you know, all you have to do is like call upon the name of the Lord. Well, calling upon the name of the Lord is a liturgical action. Look at Acts 22, you know, um, but be that as a mate, um, it, uh, yeah, it does show, like, again, even when you look at the baptism text in, like, uniquely Latter-day Saint scripture, um, just at the Book of Mormon, uh, there's various themes that are emphasized by various altars, but again, it's not a faulty either-or, it's both and. In fact, like, if I could throw in gifs, it's like, the, why not both uh, gif uh, from the Mexican girl? But um, just, like, another misconception that we discuss is, like, well, it's a human work, and you're adding to the finished work of Christ. Well, um, even Luther, who had a very low view of human ability, he wrote the bondage of will. He always held to the doctrine of baptismal regeneration throughout his theological career, you know, um, even until his death in 1546. And in his little catechism, he actually said, correctly, I will note, baptism is not a human work, but it's a work of God. It's God who works through the instrumentality of water. Simply getting dunked in water does not avail one of anything. Like, I know you don't accept the Doctrine and Covenants, but like even in the Doctrine and Covenants, that's rather explicit in Section 21 and so forth. However... But that's um, one of the early revelations, right? Oh, yeah, yeah, sure. It's yeah, yeah, the, yeah. So that that probably was in the... the Book of Commandments, Book of Commandments. Yeah. yeah. But yeah, so you guys still will like, have a privileged view of that, but it kind of shows like, it's not simply this automatic event where like, you know, like um, Paul in Romans 4 is going against the Jews who would try to legally obligate God by being circumcised and keeping kosher and the calendar... You know, but Paul is saying, well, God will not reward you, give you a salary, i.e. salvation. You know, you can't legally obligate God to reward you for it. However, God, however, baptism is a work of God. You know, um, I, I'm unaware of any theological system, uh, Roman Catholic, Eastern Orthodox, Restorationist, that claims 
uh, baptism forces God to actually give us saving grace. No, it's the means by which he gives us grace. And this can maybe be a bit technical, but I won't spend too much time on this. In any event, there's different causes. Like when you turn on a switch, like, uh, yes, you, you know, Josh flicking on the switch, that turns on the light, but that's not the only thing that causes it to happen. There's the electricity, there's a source of the electricity, you know, and so forth. Um, so although we don't have these categories, uh, we don't have these terms uh, at hand, we do know that a different event has different sources or so forth. And when it comes to, say, baptism or generation, to bit, get a bit uh, scholastic, everyone agrees that the sole meritorious cause of salvation is the atoning sacrifice of Christ and that alone. However, God uses different instruments to apply the sacrifice of Christ. And you even see this in the Calvinistic tradition, like I think it's chapter 13 of the Westminster Confession of Faith, that says that saving faith alone is the only instrument of justification. So even in like the hardcore Calvinist traditions, there's the recognition that, yes, the only meritorious source of salvation is the atoning sacrifice of Christ. We would actually agree with that. But God Clearly. uses different instruments, Clearly. Yeah. you know, and in this case, baptism is the God ordained instrument of remission of sins. So we're not actually adding to the atoning sacrifice of Christ and so forth. We just believe that water baptism is the instrument of it. And in this way, we don't fall under the anathema of Galatians 1, 6, 9, because the Judaizers were trying to put up barriers before you could enter the new covenant. And that's not the case for us. We're not trying to say, well, you must keep kosher or circumcision. And only then can Christ's atonement avail or can you be a new covenant member? You know, and I uh, think we read through our horizons and through our biases and through our modern lens and miss the challenge of the New Testament church to find its footing coming out from the law of Moses, where literally just a year before they were all coming routinely to the temple to sacrifice and the pulling away of centuries and centuries of really since they came back from Babylon. Okay. So you have about 400 years there of struggle and establishment and entrenching themselves within the minuteness of the law and then pulling themselves out of that that's what Paul is focused on in those letters. That's what he's, and he's not writing those things to, you know, throw baptism out of the, out of the church. Okay. Or out of its, out of its role within the church. He is battling because everywhere he goes on missionary work, he goes to the synagogue first and he goes to the synagogue first, and then he goes to the Gentiles afterwards. And so in each place, He's challenged and confronted with the, well, what do we actually believe out of this? And what are the foundational teachings that we need to carry on? I mean, the Romans viewed everybody as Jews, even the Christians. They were all part of this blanket umbrella. And Paul is fighting throughout the New Testament to demonstrate what was truly going to be the continuation of the gospel in spirit and in truth. And that struggle, sadly, really never ended with the letters. You know, I mean, Clement continued to struggle with the with the Corinthians. Who wrote a wrote a a letter to them very explicitly on some issues. So, it never fully rid themselves from the primary issues at hand of coming out from that tradition for so long. Yeah, that's yeah, that's true. So um, maybe with that as a preface, maybe we could like say maybe discuss one or two texts each. Like um, I do have some of my favorite texts. You have some of yours. Uh, Go for you it. kind of yeah. Uh, so one of the texts, and you actually referenced this uh, previously, and that's Romans six, three to seven. Um, yeah, that's one of my faves. Yeah, what I'll do is like I actually have some notes prepared uh, because I had some notes on baptism prepared for a previous uh, discussion. So I'll actually share my screen if that's okay. Um, I will. Yeah, right. so everyone will see this. Uh, Romans 6, 3 to 7, and this is from the King James. Um, know ye not that so many of us were baptized into Christ Jesus? So you see like this union with Christ through baptism. It doesn't precede baptism. We're baptized into his death. Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death. That like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall also in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin, but he that is dead is freed from sin. And I'll discuss verse seven Amen. momentarily. But like, this is very explicit language, language of union. You know, Paul uses a bunch of verbs with the with or soon prefix, if you will, um, 
coupled with the verbs. Like it's true baptism, we are buried with Christ. It's true baptism, we are raised up like us, and we are given new life, like Christ was given new life in his resurrection. So we have language of remission of sins in verse seven. I'll discuss that in a moment, but also union with Christ. And this union of Christ does not happen, you know, in a once saved, always saved external sense or previous to one receiving baptism. It's actually done through the means of water baptism. You know, so I think this is very explicit language. And funny enough, like uh, there's been attempts to actually argue by a number of people that when Romans 6 speaks of baptism, it's not water baptism. Paul is only speaking about union with Christ, but that's confusing the means with the purpose, if you will. Yes, we're brought about uh, um, in Christ or, or union with Christ is brought about through baptism, but it's kind of nonsensical to argue that baptism here, baptismo, refers to union with Christ. No, that's the that's the telos, if you will. Um, it, it's a kind of silly argument. And if you were to look at like historical Protestant confessions, like the Heidelberg Catechism or commentaries by Protestants in the 16th and 17th century, they would always recognize that baptism here is water baptism. And as you see, like you have two modern Protestants who do not believe in baptism regeneration, arguing that. By the date of Romans, baptized had become almost a technical expression of the right of Christian initiation by water. And this is surely the meaning of the Roman Christians would have given the word. That's Douglas Moo and Law Necker, another present. In verses three to four, Paul used Christian baptism as the basis of his exhortations to believers in Jesus to live a new life in Christ and as the primary illustration of what it means for one to live such a new life. So they're intellectually honest. Now they try to like wrangle with the text, you know, uh, about baptism and salvation but it's rather obvious that baptism here is water baptism uh, I, I don't like using this term but like uh it's only in recent decades pro some protestants now all have argued well baptism here is not water baptism but it's it's really desperate and very cultic uh when it comes to like trying to downplay the rather obvious here um now don't be wrong scripture can be a bit difficult at times but it's rather crystal clear <laughs> not not only water baptism but baptism by immersion because it's talking about being buried. So it's it's not just the fact that it needs to be water, but in those verses, to me, a real clear ex experience of being under the water and immersed in the water, which is what baptism means anyways. It means immersion. But I mean, I'm, I'm not sure you can take Romans chapter six and argue for any other form of baptism except it, to go under. Yeah. Uh, and like, to be fair, like, Eastern Orthodox and Roman Catholics, even those who believe in uh, it's allowable for like other forms of baptism, will admit the early church by and large um, immersed in baptism. You know, yeah. uh, you have like a mention in the Didache um, where there's an allowance, but it seems to be because they were living in an area where one could not actually have the opportunity to have an immersion in baptism. But they've kind of made the exception to the rule these days, especially Catholics and Presbyterians. But, but yeah, what's interesting about that with Philip and the eunuch, okay, is it seems like the Lord provides water in the mm -hmm. desert, that it almost wasn't something that they needed to. The Lord was able to perform a miracle that day on behalf of the eunuch and water was provided seemingly in the middle of nowhere and they were able to perform the ordinance. So, yeah. And just one other thing, like uh, in verse seven, the King James says, for he that is dead, he's freed from sin. Um, as I note here, like the verb used that's translated as freed is not the typical term for free. It's actually the verb, which we discussed briefly, to justify dikayao. Um, you know, and there's a parallel use of dikayao in Acts 13, 38 to 39. Therefore, let it be known to you, men and brothers, that true this one forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you, and from all the things from which you were not able to be justified, dikayao, by the law of Moses. So, of course, it's like it's a salvation sense of the term here. Uh, just as you can't be justified by the law of Moses, you are justified by water baptism in Romans 6, 7. And Would it be wrong to argue for that word to even be like translated as cleansed? Would that be wrong? Well, justified, I would translate as justified, but the meaning of justified here or the result of it would be among other things to be cleansed or freed from yeah. sin. So yeah. I wouldn't translate as cleansed, but like the act, the result of it would be among other things being cleansed from sin. The cleansing. Like, yeah. Yeah. Like um, as Joseph Fitzmaier, he's deceased now, but he was one of the leading scholars on the New Testament for a number of years. He wrote one of the best ever commentaries on Romans. Um, he comments on this verse. The other more likely explanation seeks to interpret the verb dekayao, not as free, but as justify a quit in the genuine Pauline sense. And sin, not in the sense demanded above, seemed like obligation to the law of Moses or Torah, but in its Pauline sense. 
the act of, against the will of God. The one who has died has lost the very means of sinning, the body of sin, so that one is definitively without sin. One has been freed of the, of the fleshy, sin-prone body. In either case, a change of status has ensued. The old condition has been brought to an end in baptism death, and a new one has begun. Uh, a lot more could be said about any of these texts, uh, but this kind of is a very powerful passage in my view. Uh, you know, because many opponents of uh, baptism regeneration come from a Protestant background, and one of the key tenets of their belief is not simply sola scriptura and tota scriptura, but one of the components of that is the perspicuity of scripture, i.e. scripture, when it comes to central doctrines like salvation, Christology, anthropology, and so forth, it's clear. It doesn't mean there's some difficult text, but like yeah. the overall yeah. gospel message is clear from the Bible and so forth. It's like, it, it's really crystal clear here. Um, well, if they want to clear by if they want a clear gospel message, you got to open up the Book of Mormon because there's no book more clear on that gospel message than that text. Anyways, oh yeah, I agree completely. But even in this pericope in Romans, it's yeah. it's clear. And I think like one of the best evidences for this is like how in recent decades a number of Protestants have now started to argue that baptism here is not water baptism. Um, John Greer, um, I'm not sure if you ever heard of Ian Paisley, but like he was a politician slash theologian in Northern Ireland. Um, he, I'm not a Your fan turf. of these. Yeah, yeah, my turf. Um, everyone would call him Dr. No, because he kept saying no to any type of peace process with Republicans. <laughs> but okay. he, he formed like a very strong Calvinistic church called the Free Presbyterian Church of Ulster. Uh, very separatist. Uh, makes James White look like a uh, look like an ecumenist. But like okay. one, one of these former one of these pastors, um, John Greer, once said, and this is the first time I heard it, so it's like ingrained in my mind, like when Paul speaks of baptism here, we have to be careful. Because if you meant water baptism, that's the doctrine of baptism regeneration. But as we know, baptism regeneration is false. So this is clearly what not uh, Paul uh, meant. He meant union with Christ. So there's not a drop of water in baptism in Romans 6. That's a paraphrase of a sermon about a decade ago. It's like, even a decade later, it's like, that's, the, I'm sorry, but that's really cultic. That makes like the typical JW or Dor look like a Bible scholar. It's really bad. Um, so I, I, because here, like in Romans 6, you have the union with Christ, true baptism, dying with Christ, true baptism, being given new life, true baptism. And in verse 7, you're justified in the Pauline sense by baptism. None of these, and also none of these precede baptism. Like, and I'll let you speak after this, like, the analogy often used, like it's a wedding ring, you know, um, you know, when you're married, Amen. you know, the Amen. wedding ring does not bring about baptism, but it's like, okay, but Paul's theology here is antithetical to it, you know, um, yes, you know, baptism could be likened to a marriage and since like it's a covenant, but the effects of baptism, you know, remission of sins and so forth, um, or like remission of sins comes after it's the effect of baptism. It doesn't precede it. So it's not a mere public expression of faith. It is, but it's more than that, you know. Well, and in, I mean, support, in support of that, it's identifying, okay, when we identify the purpose of why Paul's explaining that, I think it's it's rudimentary within the New Testament church, but something that can be lost today. And that is simply that post-baptism is when the ministry is laying on hands for reception of the Holy Ghost. You know, as, you know, Paul instructs Timothy, stir up the gift of God, which was given to thee through the laying on of hands. And so not to jump ahead away from baptism, but understanding that one of the purposes of that cleansing that you're speaking about, of that regeneration, is so that our bodily temple can be clean to receive something that is heavenly and holy inside of us. And so that's the, the process there that I think can get lost. And if you remove the importance of baptism, then you're and removing the regeneration that comes through that, then your temple is not prepared to receive the Holy Ghost. The Lord has a perfect order of things in this structure. Oh, that's good. Uh, any comments on Romans 6? And if not, um, no, it's there, great. Oh, no, that's well, fine. Uh, well is said. There, yeah, is there, is there any text you'd like to appeal to? I know, can you mention like some in Acts? So, um, any particular one you want to discuss? Well, I think. And if I'm getting off topic, steer me back. But one, oh, no, one it's good, it's good. yeah, I, I think one thing that can be lost in Christendom today is the prophetic perfect of what it means to be saved within this umbrella of a topic. And let me just lay out what I mean and see what you think. And if there's, you know, if we want to do something with this. But so I think it's important to recognize on the topic of salvation 
what we're safe from. I, I have a couple notes I want to just hit on this. So when it comes to what we're safe from, Romans 5, 9, God's wrath. Okay, what are we saved from? Okay, 2 Nephi 9, 24, damnation. What are we saved from? Matthew 25, 46, everlasting punishment. Oh, yes, our own sin. No, no question. Okay. And then the, the concept of salvation being saved from the judgment, the sixth point of the gospel, which is so often ignored in Christendom today. All right, so it's future tense, and and the Christendom today brings it in of, are you saved? Are you saved? Well, do you understand, number one, what you're saved from, and then the, the prophetic perfect of what that means? I don't mind you claiming that you're saved, but you recognize you're speaking in prophetic perfect. Just like Isaiah says that Christ was bruised for our transgressions hundreds of years before Christ was actually bruised for our transgressions, it's a prophetic perfect. All right. And so it's in the New Testament, 17 times is my count. You shall be saved. And it's referencing the last day. You shall be saved at the last day. The Book of Mormon, 19 times is my count. You shall be saved at the last day. And so if we misunderstand even the very concept of when we're actually saved, which is actually at the last day, before the judgment bar of Christ himself, then you're going to misappropriate the scriptures across the salvation topic and stumble your way through because if you're going, are you saved? Are you saved today, today, today? It's like, and that's where, when we get into the topic down the path here that we're heading towards of, well, once saved, always saved. Well, that completely blows up if you actually understand when you're saved. If you understand no. yeah, that there's 17 times that the New Testament scripture clearly outlines that you're saved at the last day, and there's 19 times in the Book of Mormon, talk about harmony, at the last day, then you recognize that we're saved at the end. Yeah. That seems pretty clear. And yeah. if we're saved at the end, then, well, yeah, once we receive salvation, we're never going to fall from that because we're in God's presence at that last day. Can I fall today before I'm saved? Well, <laughs> yeah, of course I can. You know, of course I can. And anyways, I, I'm not know. I don't know if we're ready for that conversation. Oh yet. no, no, no. It's, it's, but it's when good. you it's lay good. the pretense of when salvation is truly effectual, and that's effectual on the day of judgment at that last day. Well, then you can get to the understanding of well, actually, I can make the same statement. Yes, once I'm saved, I'm I'm not going to fall. But that's because I'm in Christ's presence at that day. And between now and then, can I stumble and fall away? Well, of course. Of course I can. So I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Or if you oh, think I'm in, in left field. Oh, no, no, no. I think you're correct. Because if you look at even like, because um, this will probably appeal more to Protestants. Um, let's just like focus on the Bible momentarily. But if you look at the scripture, like the New Testament or Paul's letters, there's a moment in time where you could say, yes, I've been saved, and that's baptism. But so, but there's also like, uh, and we'll discuss maybe eternal security uh, momentarily. But yeah. if you look at how justified, saved, and other terms are used, sometimes they're used in a past sense or an arist verse, verb or so forth. But sometimes they're used in a present participle, and sometimes they're used in the future. And once one realizes that, there's, you can say in a sense, you have been saved, you know, through baptism and so forth, you can say, yes, I've been saved, you know, but in you can prophetic also say, hope of what's sure. to come. Yeah. And also you are being saved and you will be saved. Like I discussed this briefly when I was teaching two Corinthians last Sunday in church, but um, the King James, for uh, this is second Corinthians 2 15 for we are unto God, a sweet savior of Christ in them that are saved and in them that perish. But if you look at the Greek, uh, it uses present principles so it should actually be uh, translated in those who are being saved and those who are perishing. It's a present principle. So there's a reality for Paul that, and the biblical authors and Christ and his use of justified as well. You can speak of saved being justified and you can truly be justified in a past sense, in a sense of remission of sins being made, not simply declared righteous and so forth. But it's also a process. You see this, for instance, in the life of Abraham. You know, when Paul uses Abraham in Galatians and Romans, he appeals to Genesis 15, 6. But that's not the initial time Abraham 
was transposed from like unrighteousness to righteousness. He was transposed or justified initially in Genesis 12. And you see this in Hebrews 11, where saving faith is credited to Abraham and his wife in Genesis 12. And if you're a Calvinist, you can't escape this because uh, you're only justified after you're given saving faith in their order of salvation. But in James 2, Abraham is also said to be justified in Genesis 22. So once one understands justification, salvation, there's a past, ongoing present, and a future reality uh, to these things. It makes a lot more sense than a legal, particular, once-for-all, external-to-you justification that can never be lost. So, yeah, I would agree with you. Now, like, yeah, because there's a justification that allows all mankind to come back into God's presence for judgment. That happens through the atonement, okay? Then there's a justification that happens through our covenantal relationship and acceptance of that on our side. And when we kind of examine it in that way, I think that kind of answers logistically how that works, in my mind, at least. Sure. Now, uh, let me tell you the um, protagonist or devil's advocate here, Like, and I'm sure you've heard this passage. is like, well, you know, if you don't believe in eternal security or you believe like, it's not simply a past event you can look on merely. Um, well, how can you actually answer 1 John 5 13 that says in the King James, you know, um, let me just pop up here. Uh, These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life, and that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. Now, I have my response, but like the typical response and question would be, well, in your theology, and this is not just against Restorationists, this is used against Catholics and Eastern Orthodox, who funnily enough would agree with much of what we're saying here today as well. Um, yeah, that, absolutely. Well, there's that, there's room at the table for this discussion. Oh, yeah. yeah. Well, if you believe in some type of synergistic uh, soteriology, or and we can discuss this momentarily, like you don't believe in eternal security. Well, how can you how can you actually have confidence that you're, you will be saved? You know, because it says in 1 John 5, during you can know if you are saved at this moment in time, you know, or I'm not sure if you had like a street preacher. I've had a few, even back in Ireland, was like, have you been saved and stuff like that? You know, um, so how would you respond to the issue of one's confidence if they don't believe in eternal security or and or they believe that justification, not just salvation, is in some sense a process, not simply a past event as well? I have two parts to this. I hope to keep my mind together for it. So the first part to it is I'm confident that I have the Holy Ghost. My confidence is not in Josh. Josh fails, and I'm not confident in myself. I'm confident in what I've been given and hold within myself that is not of me, that has changed me and made me a new creature before God. And so my confidence is not in anything that I can do. My confidence is not in myself or in the works. My confidence is in the fact that I have something today that I didn't have before, a spirit that speaks to me and talks to me and prods me and envelops me and purifies me and chastens me and corrects me. And so that, if I have that within myself, the Holy Spirit within myself truly, then I'm confident in standing before God, not because I have anything to offer him, but because I have him inside of me. And so that, that to me is where my, where I can say yay and amen. And where my confidence comes from is because I have the Holy ghost. Now, I think there's a larger issue besides one scripture in first John that the other side has to contend with. And it's the fact that there is multiple independent attestation of the phrase enduring to the end. And under that concept, under that doctrine or teaching, they are challenged to buttress that you would never hear the phrase preached from the pulpit of a, and maybe I'm wrong. Okay. I've attended several Catholic meetings. All right. I've attended probably over 20 in my lifetime. I've never heard anybody preach from the pulpit. You must endure to the end. Well, that seems a strange thing to not utter when you, especially on the topic of salvation, when you find it twice in Matthew, once in Mark, you find uh, at least two examples in Hebrews that demonstrate it. And, you know, we could go on and I could give the Book of Mormon references as well. First Nephi 13, 37, we could dive into second Nephi 31, 16 and 20, but just from the new, if we want to, you know, 
stick to a level playing field, so to speak. I think you're you're taking one scripture in First John and presenting me with it, where I can present you with about five on the topic of endurance, which never happens to come up within a Calvinist Sunday school, so to speak. But why not? Yeah, that's good. How I would respond to it, and I'll be brief, would be, first of all, if you look at the context of 1 John 5, before verse 13, John gives a series of tests for someone to examine themselves. So the no here in verse 13 is not this objective, I have infallible knowledge, I will be saved. It's a subjective, I have peace and confidence. Um, and from, kind of the great like, from the great yeah. peacemaker. Yeah, and it's kind of interesting, like Protestants who have a very low view of man and anthropology, uh, especially Calvinists, like uh, they would argue that unregenerate man can never understand the things of God. And even after they're regenerated, they still have the effects on their epistemology because of the fall, the noetic effects. So even in their anthropology, they are inconsistent in claiming they have an infallible knowledge that they're saved. They could be deceived in light of their theology as well. So a consistent but not, of, but not of second Corinthians, you know, what's it? Second Corinthians two sixteen. we have the mind of Christ. Yeah. The for okay. of Christ. So but, yeah. So, if the mind of Christ is inside of us. I mean, yeah. And also as people who believe in maps and regeneration, we actually can actually have more confidence of their state stage because we can appeal and look back on something objective and tangible ease, the sacrament or ordinance of baptism. You know, I remember mine, it's been eight and a half years. Um, you were baptized in your, I believe your teens, I think you told me. Yep. Um, yep. So I'm sure that's not too long ago. I don't think you're older, much older than me. So like, I'm sure you still remember that. So sure. you can look back on your baptism as yes, that's, that's the moment in which I was united with Christ. I died with him a la Romans six, as opposed Amen. to a possible, very subjective. I had this very emotional experience or I had a very moving experience at some kind of revival camp or what have you, you know, I, I would take the uh, more objective one over the subjective one in this respect. And I loved what he discussed about like enduring to the end. Um, a classical text is of course, Philippians 2, 12 to 13. Yeah. Um, the King James said, well, actually the NRSV, I have that popped up. Therefore, my beloved, just as ye, just as you have always obeyed me, not only my presence, but much more now in my absence, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. And in verse 13, for it is God who is at work, the Greek energia, energy in you, enabling you both to will and to work energia for his good pleasure. So even this like pericope, yeah. Paul is not saying, you know, he's not speaking about the salvation, the physical salvation or the temporary salvation of the local church at Philippi, which is like a very common Protestant interpretation. No, he's talking about the salvation, the eschatological salvation, if you will, of the members of the uh, congregation there. But also in verse 13, it's not us alone. God actually gives us his energy, his energia in Greek, enabling us, giving us the energia ourselves to actually work synergistically with God. So even, even in light of our theology, it's not a case of like, well, we do like 91% God does 99. No, it's a cooperation, you know, where um, God enables us with his uncreated energy, his energia, to actually work and cooperate with him using our free will that's now being enabled by his grace because grace is not simply a favor it's a empowerment it's it's ontic it's ontological not simply subjective like a change in status as well so uh, I, I think that's a very good text i love how you brought up the enduring to the end passages as well they're very good as well i love that and my only thing i would add to that is when you look at the that's the back side of, of philippians 2 and if you look at the front side of it Paul's actually quoting an early New Testament and even Barterman and some of the New Testament critics would agree on this. When you look at Philippians 2, those like, well, I forget if it's six 3 through 11. 8, yeah, the yeah. Christy. 6 to 11, you know, and what that is, is it's it predates Paul. So he's quoting this early New Testament doctrine that people would have memorized and shared. And it's a gospel statement that matches perfectly and, alignment. And it's him. With Third Nephi chapter 27. Yeah. And so when you have that being sung throughout the New Testament church, so to, you know, for people who are uneducated, so they can memorize it and know it of this is the message of Christ. And then on the back side of that, it's basically saying we have the what do you say, energia? Yeah, the energy or the, the energy, energy the, the spirit of God 
Okay. And then tied to that with a message of endurance, he gives the gospel statement and he, which everybody he would have given it to would have known. And after he gives it, he tells them you have to endure to the end. So according to Paul, when you follow up with a gospel sermon to those who are already baptized, you need to remind them that they need to endure to the end. And if that's not the doctrine you're teaching when you preach the gospel, you may not be actually in alignment with Paul. Yeah. Um, by the way, uh, in verse five, and I know, you know this, but it ties into what you said about having the mind of Christ. Paul actually instructs them to have the same mind uh, in, of Christ as well. So it kind of ties into what you Who said. Who was in the form of God, yeah. but thought himself not equal with God, took yeah. upon himself the condescension, and it goes on and hits all six points of 3 Nephi 27. The full yeah. gospel is within that pre-Pauline New Testament him. I love calling it a him. That's yeah, great. Well, yeah, no, it, it is him. Now, I'm kind of in the minority. I actually think Paul wrote the him. It originates with Paul. Because, um, you know, I, okay. it, it, he's, it seems like it's very good deconstruction of the uh, emperor cult of Philippi. So I I believe it was written by Paul. But even regardless of this, you go with Ehrman and Dunn, who believes it predates Paul sometime in the 30s or 40s, which is early. Even if you go with my theory, Paul's the author of it. It's still in the 50s. So this is a very early preaching yeah. tool. It's a hymn. You know, and as you know, like uh, literacy was not high. People would memorize things through song and repetition and hymns would be in one as well and you have this very high christology personal pre-existence and so forth and yet what happens to christ he's super exalted and that's promised to everyone in other passages as well where he's transformative and, and that's not a win-lose okay attributing it to paul is not a win-lose that's a win-win because yeah. either i'm attributing it to doctrines of the apostles peter james and john okay or we're attributing it to Paul, who's giving the same gospel yeah. a, a little bit later. It's a win-win. Either way, an apostle is teaching the and gospel. And it's super early as well. And it's super early. So either way, it's a win-win as far as a gospel statement goes. Yeah, I know we're not discussing Christology here, but like one thing that really irks me is like many people think like a high Christology is a second generation or later development in Christianity. It's like, you, don't worry around, there's some aspects of high Christology, like um, later Castle Doing Christology. I would strongly disagree with but the idea like say christ is creator of the genesis creation not only the new creation he was personally pre-existent he's divine and so forth it's like it's early i mean just go to hebrews which is clearly a pre-70 document or like yeah. even the hymns like um the carmen christi philippians 2 6 to 11 because no one doubts the authenticity of paul's letter to philippians ermin doesn't and he's a bit of a radical when it comes to um a number of these things as well yeah but, yeah that's but, why I, that's why i quote him on it because it's yeah Kind of like if Ehrman says it, I'm in a safe place, you know, <laughs> not yeah, that I agree yeah. with everything he says, but it's oh, no, he's Christology is a way. mess yeah, yeah. at times. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, sure. maybe, yeah, yeah. But uh, yeah, but it, it's, it's, but early. as far as a new Testament critic goes, you know, oh, yeah, totally. it's, it's reliable to use him in that way. Yeah. The very sense. fact that there's yeah. like conversions of liberal and conservative on this, that that's exactly pretty solid. Yeah. So that's how I would only respond to like the Philippi, uh, the, uh, the issue of confidence in the church, like, um, because often people portray it's like either or, either you believe in eternal security and justification is a once for all external event merely, or, and you can have confidence, or you live in trepidation each and every day of your life. And it's like, no, my dude, uh, no. Which kind of goes into like, say, well, what does the New Testament or what does the Bible teach about can a truly justified person use their salvation? And I'll let you um, make some initial comments, but let me just make a preface to this, because this is often the caricature of those who don't believe in eternal um, security. Uh, it's not the case, like, say, we have, like, no confidence in Christ. And also, it doesn't mean that we don't believe that there is no such thing as, like, a fake superficial believer. Um, you know, I've come across a few as a Latter-day Saint. I'm, I'm sure, unfortunately, you've come across a few as well in your church where uh, you would agree that person was never truly one of us. So like sure. some some texts like in 1 John 2, 19, which even then I don't think that the Yeah, John's letters this. are are key verses that tie to this. Yeah, yeah. concept. Yeah. It's like, yes. So it's not the case like, say, um, we, we we reject like anyone who claims to be a Christian or a Latter-day Saint or a Restorationist was a truly, was truly one of us. We do believe that there's such thing as superficial believers and so forth. The real question is like, can a truly justified believer lose her salvation and once you kind of get over that i think the witness to scripture is very clear there's a number of texts i often appeal to but um i'll let you start the um any particular text or text that you think do you indicate that not just like well, a superficial I, believer but like someone who's truly justified can indeed yeah. lose their salvation 
Well, Paul says, I, I fear lest I myself should be cast away. Right. So there's there's a clear example there that is an easy go to that then creates the debate. Right. Of what is he really saying? What's that really mean? But I would just lay out the simple fact that I already did. I don't I don't mean to circle back, but I think if we understand the prophetic perfect of when salvation is taking place and can I stumble between now and then, the obvious answer is yes. Yes, I can stumble. Yes, I can fall between now and then. Paul himself says it. He says that, you know, and and when we look at that verse and we tie it in with the prophetic perfect of salvation coming at the last day, well, are we at the last day? No. Have I inherited the kingdom of God yet? No. Once I inherit the kingdom of God, am I going to fall? Not if I've inherited it. That would be my argument. Once I'm in the gates, I don't think I'm going to fall after that point. When I'm in the presence of the Holy One, I'm not going to fall. I'm not in his presence today. I have him dwelling inside of me. Can I botch that? Absolutely. And I I would I would petition that the timing of salvation is off when we say once saved always saved. You're you're misaligning the timing. And then I would I would go to Corinthians and say here's a clear example and there's others, but my clearest example is I fear lest I myself should be cast away. Yeah, in fact, um, if you look at the screen, I actually have the uh, King James uh, on it, because that's a very good text. I like using this one, and maybe we should read like verses 24 to 27. And the, um, in 24, well, even verse 12, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. fall. Yeah. Yeah, so like verses 24 to 27, uh, know ye not that they which run a race. So he's using the imagery of the, the gladiator, the athlete, you know, um, Run all but one receive the prize, so run that you may obtain. And every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. So we speak about heavenly rewards and salvation, you know, the crown here to Stephanos. Um, I therefore so run, not as, cer- not as certainly, so I fight, I, not as one that beateth the air, but I keep under my body and bring it under subjection. That's that by any means, which when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. But if you look at the Greek for terms that translate as castaway, it's the Greek term adokimos. And that's the term for a reprobate in scripture, someone who's not elect, someone who's not saved. So one is forced to like actually argue a few things here. Uh, that Paul is speaking hypothetically, but there's no evidence he's speaking hypothetically. He's just given a true warning to believers at current. And reprobate so, is as strong of absolutely. a word that you could possibly, possibly use in that instance. It doesn't so, get any stronger than that. Yeah. So like, uh, unless of course one claims that Paul was ignorant of a very important doctrine, i.e. eternal security or perseverance of the saints, or he was engaged in a de- type of deception. Um, it's pretty clear, like even Paul, who was an apostle, he was clearly saved, um, you know, at that stage, you know, even he believed he could stumble and become adokimos, a reprobate. Not simply like lose some heavenly rewards merely, but actually eternally be separated from God. Um, one has to engage in all gymnastics, and, yeah. and you know, as with many of these texts, like there's a lot of um, attempts to explain it, but I think they're very lame. I mean, if you just take the text seriously, using the historical grammatical method and so forth, Paul does believe even he himself could actually lose his salvation and become a non-elect person, a reprobate and adokimos. So. <laughs> So, but like, um, there's other texts I like to appeal to. Like, uh, one text is like, uh, the Epistle to the Hebrews. Um, yeah, there's a lot in Hebrews. Yeah, there's there's loads. It's of texts. why it's why it's a controversial text, really. Yeah. So, like, uh, Hebrews six four to six, um, it is impossible for those who once were enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the word world to come. If they shall fall to renew them again unto repentance, seeing that they crucify to themselves the Son of God afresh and put him to an open shame. And their text is Hebrews uh, 10, 26 to 29. Uh, for if we if we sin willfully after we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remains no more sacrifice for sins. You know, but a certain fearful looking for judgment and fury indignation, which shall devour the adversaries. He that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses. Of how much sore punishment suppose ye shall be taught worthy, who had trodden under the feet of the Son of God, and accounted blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified, and holy and unholy tain, and had done despite unto this spirit of grace. And these two passages, and my others in Hebrews, 
um, it's resulting in like loads of attempts to explain this away. Like, well, the author of Hebrews, who I believe be Luke, uh, based on the Sermon of Paul, um, is only speaking hypothetically, you know, and you know, it's he's describing a situation that can never happen, or he's addressing mixed believers, and he's only addressing this to like the non-elect or non-saved people. The thing is, like, my dude, look at the text. He spe he speaks of people having had this experiential knowledge of the gospel. Like, they've tasted the heavenly gift. They've been enlightened. And funny enough, early Christians believe that term from Tiso, enlightened was a reference to baptism like Justin. Uh, and all this language of experience, it's not superficial, it's real. They've been enlightened and they've partaken of the gospel and so forth. They're a true believer. And even in verses 26 to 29 of chapter 10, it speaks of how they have been sanctified in the Protestant understanding of justification sanctification only happens once you're justified so these people in this in their order of salvation have already been salvifically justified and also speaks of how if they sin willfully there's no more sacrifice for sin which indicates two things one they've they've previously received and uh the atoning sacrifice of christ you know um and being must have been cleansed for their sins if they have been sanctified but also uh, it kind of goes against calvinism which teaches like christ died for the elect and the elect only but that's a different matter so there's so, so when you texts. look at chapter six there yeah. and the imagery that's being used. Okay. So let's cross that to something I referenced earlier. So it's specifically referencing. Yeah, I think we would both agree that is talking about somebody that has received the Holy ghost. So they've believed in the gospel. They've repented of their sins. They've been baptized. And according to the new Testament order of the church, they had hands laid on them by the ministry to receive the Holy ghost. I that's agree. the structure we see throughout the new Testament. So that's uh, what's uh, being uh, described. Uh, and in before Hebrews you continue. Six. And be forgetting, yep. like clearly not a superficial believer, someone who was faking it, someone who was actually truly committed and truly saved. To you, that's said. what's being spoken of in that chapter for sure in in Hebrews six. Now let's look at the imagery we looked at before pertaining to the Holy Ghost being a sealing. Okay, sealing meaning like I what what I want everybody to picture is picture something that contained wine, and was sealed that had contained wine. All right, and that's the imagery that's being used to describe when somebody's sealed by the Holy Spirit. Now, picture that seal being broken prematurely, early. What's going to happen in that wine? If you break the seal, it's going to get, okay, maybe this is only a Church of Jesus Christ bicker tonight reference because we're allowed to drink wine. All right, so. It but, ruins this, yeah. <laughs> sorry, but it, the wine gets tainted. Yeah. The wine gets tainted. What's being described in Hebrews chapter 6? Somebody that's being sealed by the Holy Spirit, breaking that seal early, and it gets tainted. That's exactly what's being described there. Anyways, that's my thoughts, my opinion on it. And sorry, I'm I'm allowed to have a glass of wine while I I uh, teach that. So <laughs> I'll refrain from making any comments about like that's um, fine. Yeah, that's fine. fine. <laughs> yeah, uh, we're friends. It's it's just all in good humor. Uh, we. For those listening, we once showed uh, before I gave up soda for my health. Um, you know, we you know we'll meet up and he'll have a glass of black stuff, i.e. Guinness, but he'll pre I'll pretend it's Dr. Pepper. We'll have a glass <laughs> of the other black stuff, Dr. Pepper, but he'll pretend it's Guinness. So there we um, go. There we uh, go. Yeah. Um, so, but yeah, that's yeah, that's a good point because it does show. Uh, and also, like there is like reference like in scripture to the arabone of the seal of the Holy Spirit, but you know, just as the seal on the Christ tomb could be moved, so in some sense we could actually move away from that ceiling or destroy and so forth. You know, it's not a done and dusted deal until, as you know, um, the eternal age, if you will, you know, and then we'll be eternally secure and not because we will be totally sanctified and perfected. There won't be any uh, volition to like commit sin and so forth. But, um, but yeah, I mean, like, again, you know, I'm not one who holds the Protestant idea, like say the Presbyterian of scripture, because they're like difficult texts, you know, we do both believe the importance of say, additional scripture and so forth. Yeah. But again, a number of these texts are like, they're very crystal clear. And I think one of the greatest evidences of that our interpretation is correct is like the absolute stretching one must engage in to explain the clear, perspicuous meaning at a plain level, you know, a prima facie reading of all these texts. Like um, another one is like John 15, where Jesus says like, you know, um, you know, how they're in the vine but if they were to like uh, become corrupted they'll be cut off from the vine and cast into fire um he was not talking about some kind of uh pseudo branch he was actually talking to someone who was a branch if you will of that vine the true vine but because they become corrupted they're cast out of the true vine and sent into fire um 
it's like, well, you know, they were never actually truly in the vine. It was a pseudo vine or it's like, then you're just making Jesus into like a very bad teacher. So much so like uh, Jonathan Edwards in his commentary on Ezekiel 18, that speaks like, say, um, you know, the man who does righteousness in all these days, but if he were to fall away, he'd be condemned. But someone who does bad in all these days, but um, if he repents, you know, he'll be saved. You know, that's paraphrasing Ezekiel 18. Edwards in his comedy said, like, it appears like God did not reveal to the Old Testament saints that the doctrine of eternal security. <laughs> um, it's like, yeah, I would agree, but he didn't reveal it to the New Testament saints as well for particular reasons. But it's like, it should be known, like, eternal security in the Protestant understanding is like a novelty. Uh, even Augustine did believe like a truly justified person could lose their salvation. Um, he believed like to the elect, they were given like say the gift of perseverance, but even then um, they could still fall without being re-justified. You're not going to find like say any Protestant understanding of eternal security until John Calvin, uh, just as you don't find any rejection of baptism or regeneration until Calvin and Zwingli. Um, and yet we're meant to believe that the gospel as understood by Protestants, um, however understood, has been there um, since day one. Um, but, you know, I won't bog this discussion down with, like, say, uh, Protestant history and patristics, but it, 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 it ain't there beyond proof texting. But yeah, um, again... Well, and just, just the, off the top of my head, Robert, the only other scripture that comes to mind to me off the top of my head on the concept of, of falling is the warnings at the end of Revelation. And, you know, I think, well, we recognize that that's pertaining to the book of Revelation itself in isolation, but still, if your name can be blotted out from the book of life, that's a pretty interesting warning to have if you can't fall. But I'd love to hear your comment on that as well. No, so, I agree. Like those passages in Revelation that speak of like how one's name would be blotted out of true sin. It's like it indicates your names are in the book of life. There's no other way to interpret that, right? Yeah, I mean, your like, name's in there at one point, yeah, which because how, how can't be true if, it, if you blow up original sin to the final degree of Calvinism, then it's not in there to begin with. Yeah, right? totally. You can't it. argue it's there and begin with if you yeah. believe in original sin. So somewhere between being born and death, it's written in. And then somewhere between living and death, it's blotted out. But if you believe in original sin, it's you can't argue it's there from the start. So, yeah, yeah I, I I think those texts are rather clear. It's like yes, Revelation is an apocalyptic text, but at the same time, it's still trying to convey truth. And when there's a warning text that Correct. says if you commit sin, you know uh, your you, name you will, will be blotted fall. out. Yeah, yeah, your name will be blotted out of the tree, uh, book of life. It's like. It's not hypothetical. It does refer to something because how how else does it work? Unless first your name was in the book of life, which would mean at, at least at that time you were in a safe stage. But if your name will be blotted out, that means you've lost a safe stage. Um, and, and if yeah. it's all under control of the, of God the Father at the beginning, then did he make a mistake, or are we making the mistake? Yeah, and this is where like it makes sense in light of our theology, like synergistic soteriology, um, but. And yes, there is like a rejection of eternal security, at least on this side of the veil, if you will. But again, those texts, I don't know if we agree with you. That's a very good uh, concept that you appeal to. It's like, square this circle for me. Because as you know, like, especially if you believe in total depravity, and, uh, you know, or, or some type of Augustinian understanding of original sin, it clearly was not there in the beginning. You know, it has to be remitted, um, you know, through either infant baptism or what have you. Or if you're a Calvinist, like, God justifying you and as a result sanctifying you and so forth. You know, um so you can't so, argue for a book that had everybody's names yeah. on it from the beginning. So you, you can't, can't claim like it was an eternal it. past, you can claim it at birth. Yeah. But as you know, sometime between your one's mortality, it was in the book of life. So it was put there, but then it was removed. So why was it put there in the first place? Um who who made the mistake, God or us? And I don't think we'd make the mistake. We wouldn't argue. I wouldn't argue that God made the mistake. Yeah, like so. I, I, I'm an open taste. And even then, I don't think God is mistaken about things. So, yeah. uh, you know, so again, this, you know, it wouldn't be like the first text to go to, but like it would be a very good um, square to circle moment for me when I'm discussing yeah. things. You know, it's like, yeah, that's a very good text to appeal to you. Like uh, the, the warning passages about one's name being. Do you have any others? That, that was the only other one that I had off the top of my head. But well, one I appeal to is like in Romans four, there's two examples of a justified person. 
um, Abraham in Genesis 15, 6, which funny enough is not the first time he's justified. He's justified in Genesis 12, which shows for Abraham, it's a process, not simply a declaration in the past. But Paul actually uses a second example of a justified person. That's King David, where he quotes from Psalm 32. But if you look at Psalm 32, this was written after David repented of his sins of adultery with Sheba and murder of Uriah the Hittite. So does that mean that David was a, uh, before like these events in his life, you know, his adultery and his murder, he's actually described in scripture as being a man after God's own heart. That's not said about anyone else in scripture, but it's repeating, it's mentioned in Samuel, but it's also repeating Acts. But this, he was a man after God's own heart before adultery and murder. So he was a justified person. But Paul is using his post-repentant uh, Sam, Sam 32, as an example of a justified person. And this would kind of indicate like something happened between before David committed these, these heinous sins and afterwards. And it seems to indicate that David actually lost his justification. He had to be brought to repentance by Nathan the prophet in the book of 2 Samuel. But if Sam 32 is speaking of the justification of David, that would indicate at least he was justified on two occasions. But unlike Abraham, where it was a process, in the, in the case of David, David was initially justified. He was a man after God's own heart. He committed these heinous sins. He lost his salvation, and he was restored to justification around the time when he wrote his um, psalm, where he asked God not to take away his Holy Spirit. He repented of his sins of murder and um, murder and adultery, uh, and so forth in Psalm 32. And David uses that as an example of alongside David, uh, Abraham in Genesis 15, 6, of an example of a justified person. So that would be, it, it wouldn't be the first th uh, place I go to, but because Romans 4 is often abused to support like forensic justification, it indicates um, in the case of Abraham and David, justification is a process. In the case of David, it can be lost and it can be restored again, so, um, which kind of makes sense in like, light of the various aspects of soteriology we would hold to, like justification not just simply being a external event it's also internal it's a process it ebbs and flows because we can grow in righteousness and as you mentioned like say the verbs of salvation and justification that makes sense of it as well but also the very use of the old testament you know like as i said paul does not appeal to genesis 12 for abraham at saving feet a la hebrews 11 it's actually genesis 15 6 so in the case treat entire chapters in genesis of good works um you know and Again, David in Psalm 32, which would indicate that was not the very first time David was actually justified. And it only makes sense if he lost his justification. So David um, is an example of someone, a truly justified person. He was a man after God's own heart. Actually falling so far, he actually lost his saved state and had to be restored to it, as we read in 2 Samuel and the book of Psalms. I think that's a, a beautiful and hopeful example. It, it gives everybody, even if they've come into the Lord and tasted of the tree and fallen off into a forbidden path, it, it gives hope. It gives life and breathes life into everybody that we're around. I think that's a great example. Beautiful. So um, I know we kind of been going off like maybe, um, how long is now? Um, a bit. So maybe if we were to wrap this up, like, do you have any, like, uh, any further uh, comments or uh, issues you think, like, uh, maybe worthwhile or any resources you think have been good in your study of um, these various topics? Well, I, I think I would encourage everybody to really dive in to some of the scriptures that are within the Book of Mormon and really apply some of the, the writings in the Book of Mormon to examine these. I know this discussion, and it's inevitable that this discussion almost falls under the terms of somebody that believes in sola scriptura because you're you're addressing them where they're standing. Yeah. But to solidify for a restoration believer, the beautiful passages on baptism that are in the Book of Mormon. You referenced Mosiah 18 earlier. We, we need to read that every, you know, you need to be, re we need to be reading that chapter and examining our walk with the Lord as we read that and how we're interacting with our fellow man as we read that. We, we need to be into the Book of Mormon more than ever before. I mean, e each one of us, because there's, there's incredible texts on each parts of these that are in conjunction and fully aligned 
with the rest of God's word. And so I, I think that uh, it only further supports and solidifies our faith. And I think that it would be an interesting challenge for somebody who's actually outside of the restoration movement to examine and examine and read the Book of Mormon for yourself for those passages, not to nitpick the onesie twosies that you can maybe take out of context, but to actually read some of those stories, actually read some of the theology that's in the text. I think it would be enlightening for anybody inside and outside the restoration movement. If we're inside the restoration movement, no excuse. Let's get in there. No, that's good. Um, yeah, and it would appeal like, yeah, uh, going to toe to toe and using like a common um, source like the Bible is important. You know, uh, you don't want to give the impression sure. like you can't hold your own when it comes to scripture and reading the Bible. But yeah, there's like a number of things that are rather explicitly laid out in the Book of Mormon that clarifies the number of things, like the baptismal covenant, Mosiah 18, and many other issues as well. Like, um, for whom does Christ intercede for? The nature of atonement, and many other issues that are explicit in the uh, Book of Mormon. So. Yeah, that's a good resource. And for those who want more further information, if you go on my blog, you type in, say, baptism or justification, you'll come across like some articles I've written. Uh, for instance, I've written an entire article in John your book, your yeah. book on. Yes. Yeah. Free PDF for anyone who asked for a copy, by the way. But uh, yeah, um, well, I'll end it there because I think we've uh, discussed like a number of uh, fun topics uh, and it's lengthy enough um, as it is. But uh, Josh, again, thanks for coming on. I do appreciate it. And hopefully uh, we can meet in person in the near future as well at some Book of Mormon conference. Absolutely. And Robert, I appreciate the invite. I appreciate your hospitality in interfaith dialogue. I think it's beautiful. I've enjoyed it. And I look forward to doing it again sometime. Well, hopefully we'll have you on in the near future again to discuss some other topic. Um, but Great. until then, uh, thanks again for your time and all the best.